it's time to play ball. Welcome to the podcast with no limits. Whether it be sports, current events, or random thoughts, this is the place to step in and stay a while. Your host is a proud alumnus of Rio Hondo Prep, a former minor league baseball umpire, and a man with strong opinions. Welcome to the Get Home Safe podcast and your host, Matt Persima. Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Get Home Safe. It is a Friday edition of the podcast. Happy Friday to everyone out there as another weekend is approaching. And, uh, you know, that means more fun, hopefully, or some relaxation, whatever you need to do to uh, recharge for the following week and keep this crazy year going. Uh, well, off, off and running we are. But anyway, on Fridays, we've had a wonderful guest the past few weeks, as we often try to do. And I got another great guest for you guys today. We're going to be joined by Mr. David Guerrero. Uh, the father of Real Hondo Prep running back, Jonathan Guerrero. Uh, we're going to talk some Real Hondo Prep football. We're going to talk about Mr. Guerrero's uh, previous time uh, back, at, back in the day, him playing some football. I know he's had some uh, another son play uh, Real Hondo Prep football. So uh, the, the Real Hondo roots run deep here with the Guerrero family. And we'll talk about Jonathan. We'll talk about uh, Dave Jr. We'll talk about David Sr. himself. Uh, a lot to, lot to talk about. A lot of stories, I'm sure. A lot of fun memories from Real Hondo Prep and Care Youth League and uh, you know, as I've often said, even if you're not affiliated or know much about Real Hondo and Care Youth League, I think the stories here really can uh, help paint a picture for the wonderful organizations and the wonderful, wonderful school uh, that is Real Hondo and, and give you guys an idea of uh, what it's like for so many of the alumni. So I won't waste any more time as we want to hear from our guest today, Mr. Da David Guerrero. So let's bring him on the program and have another fun, long form conversation here on the Get Home Safe podcast. Okay, it is my privilege to be joined by Mr. David Guerrero Sr. from the class of 1984 at Rio Hondo Prep, someone who was on the 1982 CIF football championship team who played in uh, three straight CIF finals, which I had not known before our uh, brief conversation beforehand. Mr. Guerrero, welcome to the Get Home Safe podcast. Thank you for having me, Matt. I appreciate um, this podcast, especially the coverage of Real Hondo Prep football. It's been it's been great, and I've I've listened not to all of all, all your podcasts, but uh, you know I've listened to quite a few lately. You've got my interest after football season. I kind of dropped off listening, but I'm back listening, catching up on old episodes. So I appreciate your uh, podcast. It's 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 great hearing these stories. Oh well, thank you so much. Um, it's fun to have. Uh, people like yourself on to tell me the stories. I just, I just kind of ask a few <laughs> questions and, and away we go. But I, I will say it's not too often where an idea uh, comes out almost the way you wanted it. And I was very happy with how things worked out in the football season this year, kind of doing the, the recap of games and the previewing and the conversations with players and coaches. I mean, that was just an absolute blast. And I'm glad to hear that you and other parents really enjoyed it as well. Yeah. I think the, the media, We've never had uh, so much media coverage <laughs> of a sport, football, of Rio Hondo Prep, and it's. I think it's just going to continue to grow, which is good. I think, of course, the kids love it and the parents love it. So I think it's really going to help Rio Hondo Prep sports in general. And um, so I appreciate Matt all, all the coverage that you provided this past season. Oh, and it's an honor. It's um, you know what? It's a way you always wish you could do more in some areas. Some of us can give money. Some of us can give time and some, you know, whatever you can do. I think that's what real, what makes real Hondo prep great is, is the, the constant, uh, you know, interaction with the alumni uh, you played back in the, in the eighties, uh, your youngest son, Jonathan just got done playing. Um, and so it had, it's gotta be fun for you to not only, play there yourself, but then to see both of your boys and your daughters also playing at the school, but to see your boys playing football yeah. for Real Hondo Prep. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been fun. I kind of got, uh, I had an idea like, well, let me, I like, I like football. Football is my favorite sport. It wasn't growing up, but football became my favorite sport and I just love watching film. And so I, I asked, uh, I think I asked Mark Carson. I didn't ask Mr. Drain. He was when he was the head coach. I asked Mark, Hey, can I go on the sideline and start videoing? And from a sideline perspective, and he said, yes. And that's so I was on the sideline. It's been great being on the sideline, getting up close action, watching the game from there. So it's been great. I, yeah. Well, you have that head camera. It is a great camera shot uh, when you can 
uh, kind of get the feel, the sights and the sounds of being up close like that. Sometimes an aerial look is good, but being right there at field level, you get an idea of what the sideline, what the kids are seeing on the sideline, the coaches and everything. And, uh, you know, I, I do want to say uh, kind of before we go down memory lane that, you know, watching your son, Jonathan Guerrero, uh, was truly a joy. I know you're incredibly proud of him, but for alumni like myself and others, to me, Jonathan really summed up what Real Hondo Prep football is about. He's short in stature, but he played. Uh, way bigger than his appearance was, and just one of the best running backs, in my opinion, in real Hondo prep history. I appreciate you saying that. It's hard to, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, I'm prejudiced, but <laughs> it's hard to compare. It's hard to compare running backs over generations. You know, you know I saw uh, Tycho, uh, Nate mm -hmm. Tycho played, and he was awesome. So all these guys, you know, I can't uh, say, you know, he was the best or anything like that. I, I didn't see Landon play. But all these guys, their stats speak for themselves. I think when you see their stats, you got to compare. You can say, okay, these guys were really good in there when they played. So that's why uh, that's all I can base it on their stats and watching them play. But Jonathan is definitely one of the best running backs that I've seen at Rio Hondo Prep. So can I ask you this? Being being the dad, I mean, you you think I'm sure your your son can do anything, and we'll talk about your other son as well. But right now, I mean, just kind of with the recent, uh, you know, the season ending. When, when Jonathan started to run the ball in high school, I mean, did you know that he could be as explosive and, and great as he was, despite kind of being a little guy? Because I think me, like a lot of other people, the first time you see him, you're like, that he's, he's going to run the ball. Like, I mean, it's, it's no knock on him. It's just your, what your eyes see. And then your eyes tell the story differently when you see him start running the ball. But did you always know that he would kind of be this great athlete? Um, when he was um, started playing at five, you know, he was really aggressive and liked football. I don't know why. I, did. I mean, I never pushed him or said, you know, I never had to you know, motivate him, yell, go get the ball or, you know, do this, do that. Or, But he was just motivated on his own to play football. He loved football. So on the kickoffs, he'd be the first guy running down the field to tackle the guy. You know, <laughs> he'd be like storming down the field. And then when he started running the ball, he was just like, uh, he would, he would look and, look for the opening and run. And I, I attributed it to kind of his, um, when he was younger, he had OC, I think he had OCD. Everything had to be precise in its place. So when he ran the ball, he was looking for, he wouldn't just run, you know, he wouldn't just run one direction. He would look, see what the, what, you know, what was open. And then he would maneuver through there. So I think that had to do with his, you know, trying to be precise and, and look for an opening hole. But yeah, when he was, um, one practice, you know, Paul Clark was one of his coaches when he was a little kid, like probably third grade or something like that. And he, he, Jonathan was making a run and uh, Paul, uh, Peter Clark, Peter Clark, excuse me, Peter Clark said, who is this Barry Sanders? Because that's the way he would, he would, he would run and wait for the block. And, you know, that's, that's unusual at that age. You know, you're usually the runner just at that age, they're just taking off. Right. Just, but he would look for a hole, move around get through the hole and then take off. So, um, of course, his size was, a, uh, you know, I thought, well, he's going to do the best he can. And I guess I, I was concerned when he got to be a freshman and, and, and he played JVs fine. Everything was good in JVs, but then they brought him up for the playoffs. And I saw him the first time he was on the field, return a kickoff with Gio Ortega. I said, what's going on? Why is he in the, why is he out there? Return a kickoff. And uh, actually it was in, and it was in the regular season. And uh, I was I was really concerned for his for his health. I didn't allow him. You know, he had to sign a waiver yeah. for him to play as a freshman. I didn't do that immediately because of his size, and I didn't want him out in the field getting. But then when he got out there, I thought, okay, he can do it. He's 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 good. Yeah. Now now so uh, you know, dad dad rooting for uh, Jonathan is uh, the little guy is one thing, but how did. How did mom feel about all this? Uh, you know, I think mothers are a little more protective of uh, their sons than fathers are. She's, uh, she, you know, she, for her, she's, he's the best ever. And all, so he can do anything. I'm, I'm more, I'm realistic. Like, Hey, he's, he's small. You got to watch out for him. But no, yeah. she's like, she's the, on the other side. She's like, he can, he can do anything. He can, you know, so she's not so cautious, I guess. That's good. That is, <laughs> I remember. Like, 
But she's in, she's never played football. She doesn't know what goes on, I guess. On the <laughs> <laughs> it's a violent, violent, uh, uh, you know, game indeed. So I remember seeing him for the first time. I think it was a playoff game, and I saw him run the ball between the tackles as a freshman. I was like, yeah, yeah. I, I was like, he's gonna get hurt. But then to see him run, and then of course his sophomore year is where he really took off, and I think that's when people really started to take notice. Like, hey, uh, you got to start stop looking at this kid for the, the size that he is and start looking for the way in which he looking at the way in which he plays, because he put up some big numbers, uh, the, the big touchdown against Pasadena Poly um, in 2019, I believe that was yeah. um, at their place to seal the league, the league win. And they had the great playoff game at Harupa Valley um, or Harupa Hills. I think it was uh, yeah. yeah. His sophomore year, he really took off in my opinion. Yeah. He wouldn't have, um, Mr. You know, when he was uh, on JVs, he was doing great, fine. He and Gio were the, the backs. And so they shared, you know, running uh, duties. And Gio was, Gio was great at running back. And, but Mr. Johnson had, had concerns about him playing varsity because um, and Mr. Mr. Johnson said, well, they could just grab him and pull him down. You know, they just tackle him by grabbing him and pulling him down. So, <laughs> So, you know, when you go into, you know, Bryant was a, a great running back. He was the starter and he's a, he was a, that year he was a senior. So Jonathan probably wasn't going to run that much when he was a sophomore. Bryant got injured. So Jonathan had an opportunity. And I think Jonathan, uh, you know, proved that he could, he could compete and play at, at varsity when he was a sophomore. And, um, you know, he, he just knows how to run the ball. I think that's the big difference. He's he, because of his size. He just knows he knows how to run the ball. He knows how to get between the tackles. He knows how to make one move, make a, a guy miss, and and get and run down the field. So, um, if he didn't have that, so I mean, really, he he probably wouldn't have had a sophomore year. Bryant was injured, mm -hmm. and then COVID year, he wouldn't have had a COVID. You know that year, so he would have just had one year of varsity football, really, uh, at tailback. So. He was very fortunate to get that sophomore year in things, things work out, um, you know, how they're supposed to. And um, yeah. yeah, he made the most of the opportunity. That team, uh, that, that team was amazing. That uh, that 2019 team, that offensive line, uh, uh, yeah. you know, the, just the, the whole group of guys there was incredible. The, the COVID shortened year, that was disappointing to have only the three game season, but to be able to play in the Rose bowl, I know it was exciting for Jonathan and his teammates. Yeah, they, that was, that was great. That was, um, you know, if they didn't have that, I think it would have been a really hard year, mm -hmm. harder than it was, but um, that was, uh, that was uh, nice that, you know, that was, I think it made the season. Okay. That they Definitely. were able to play in the Rose bowl. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Jonathan finishes, uh, you know, with being a uh, three, three games in a row over Pasadena Poly. That's always uh, awesome yeah. to hear. Yeah. And uh, you know, Mr. Guerrero, the, the biggest game, I think one of the arguably in school history occurred uh, in the playoffs against Charter Oak. I know Rio Hondo has won championships left and right, but to me, what Jonathan and his teammates did against Charter Oak, in the first round of the division seven playoffs to me that almost that game almost deserves a banner in itself for what those guys did and, and the noise they made the, their voices really uh, stood out for all of the alumni and everyone before them that that game was so huge for the program i think yeah you know that's why I, football is you know like i said basketball was my favorite sport and but football when i got into high school and it just became became my favorite sport because it's such a, a more of a team sport than any other sport that I that I've ever played or can think of because all all the people on the field have to run the play. It's a you know it's a it's like a, you know a, you know a, when you're on Broadway, everyone has their spots and everyone does mm -hmm. their thing and everyone does it's a it's a you plan it out, you rehearse, and you have to execute the play. And then practice, you have to have the guys practicing against you. They have to put an effort in or else, um, you know, you're not going to have legitimate practices. But, yeah, so the, the whole team, everyone who's, who's on that field uh, really did a great job. And what I do, I, you know, I, I love football, so I watch too much football. I, I watched the huddle. I, I checked out uh, Charter Oak, and I, I said, wow, they're – Defensive line is the best part of their whole team. Their defensive line, they they held um, Glendora 
for three quarters, all because of their defensive line. Their defensive line was just stopping the run, putting pressure on the quarterback. He couldn't throw the ball. Um, and I said, well, if they, if we can beat their defensive line, in my opinion, then we can win the game. If we can, if we can keep their defensive line uh, at ch check, checked, then we can win the game. And, and what happened, and people don't see it because they're watching the ball, I understand, but you have to go back and watch the video and see our defensive line was pushing them back. And, and, and what Kyle Horton was saying was initiate a new, new line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. And so the def our, I mean, our offensive line, our offensive line was pushing them back and, and just doing tremendous work on, on their defensive line. And if you listen to the broadcast, you'll hear their, co their coaches were sitting next to Kyle and, um, and Clark. And you could hear them, you know, they're, they're cussing in there, unfortunately, but <laughs> you could hear them. I was like, what the heck is going on? This guy is getting blocked down the field, you know, 10 yards down the field. What's going on? And so if you, so I, I attribute a lot of that, that win to the offensive line, how they just controlled, uh, controlled that defense line. Also our coaching was, uh, was great. They, uh, I, I found out that Will Torico, um, watching film, he was able to figure out what their plays were, call their signals on the sideline. And also during the game, their coach, coach staff yelled out that 99, their best defense alignment was going to line up over Paul Molina. <laughs> so, so obviously you can be, if he's going to line up wherever Paul is, then we're going to run, you know, somewhere else. Right. <laughs> so just good coaching, great coaching, great support. It was just, uh, and then the alumni coming out and parents and families, just, it's a family event football. That's why football is so great because it's, it becomes like a, a family event where everyone comes out to support. And that's what makes, makes real hunt prep football uh, fun. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's, there's, it's so unique to other sports and isn't it amazing that it, football, everyone talks how the game is changing and this and that, isn't it, a, isn't it crazy how, no matter what fancy offenses you run or trick plays or whatever, it all does come down to those guys up front, the offensive and defensive line football is one in the trenches, no matter how you skin it, it, that is how the game is. And uh, to your point, yeah, the, 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 the boys that night were spectacular. Paul Elena, Ray Montez, uh, 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 Royal young, uh, uh, Jaden Sanchez, all those guys up front. I don't want to forget any names, but uh, they were phenomenal against a much bigger defensive line of charter Oak. Yeah. And uh, that's what I tell people, go listen to that broadcast and turn the volume all up, uh, all the way up and listen to the coaches sit next to the broadcast, you know, they're cussing and swearing and, you know, all this, but they're just like, you know, they're baffled. They're like, what's going on? You know, <laughs> get that, get that guy out of there. Cause they're jumping off sides, you know? <laughs> oh yeah. So they're frustrated, but um, also what I want to say is that, you know, our offense, uh, our offensive scheme, even though it's, it's, uh, it's simple, we do uh, misdirection. So mm -hmm. we put the defense kind of, uh, they have to wait to see where the ball is going to go before they can make a move. And I look at these other offense who have the quarterback in the shotgun, they have one back. It's basically a read off and they give it to him. And the, I mean, there's no creativity at all in, in those offenses. And what we have, we have to have a little bit of misdirection. We'll run, you know, a reverse now and then keep them off balance. Cause I think if we were running just straight ahead, um, I think, you know, if we were that predictable, I think it would be hard. It'd be hard, but um, so credit the, the, the coaches for their offensive scheme. And well, you, so you see, you good, see a lot of the similarities you know, from uh, Randy Johnson's play calling to his father, Randall Johnson, it was the eight man era with his dad, but Randy's really taken some of the concepts and blended them. It took some time when we went 11 man, our first year, uh, we were the Guinea pigs and we were learning as we went, but I thought, I think the offense has really morphed into what it is today. And you're right. The manipulation of the eyes by the defense, just uh, right. two back sets, almost no one runs a two back offense anymore. And I right. think the offense, suits guys like Jonathan guys like just the real Hondo prep uh, athletes and the linemen you're going to get too. the offense is very unique to anything else uh, that I've seen anywhere. I just say one more thing about the offense because you were a quarterback, right, Matt? Yeah. Yeah. I never saw, I got to see you play, but there's this play that's that, you know, I saw Scott Weidman and we ran uh, when I was in high school, 
is where it's a pitch, quick pitch 37, like we used yeah. to call it. And the pullback runs up to the, you know, behind the, behind the uh, tight end and you pitch it under his arm. You know, the, <laughs> the yeah. pullback puts his arms up and you pitch it. Well, they're still running that play. But uh, I don't think they run it as well as, as we did. Yeah. Or as Scott White, when Scott, I remember when Scott Weidman ran that play, uh, he, he was great with ball fakes and, and I mean, he, he was great. But the fullback, he would put his hands up and the ball would go right under. So you wouldn't know if he, the fullback had the ball or not. It was a, yeah, if it was a, di- it looked like a dive to the fullback. Yeah, it looked that, like a dive, but the pitch, and the, the ball go, right, yeah. So anyway. It's running the same place. <laughs> yeah, you. it's funny in that, like, we talked about the concepts. Like, I remember talking, breaking the film down with Coach Carson and everything, and he was, you know, we're, we're running these plays, and I'm like, I have no idea how the quick pitch works. Like, it shouldn't work. You don't block the, the guy closest to the ball, and it's just right. like, yeah, our back has to outrun him, and we have to execute that. It's just little things like that that make it so unique yeah. compared to anything else. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, a great win for, for the boys uh, there in the, in the playoffs. Unfortunately, the season came to an end. Uh, what was it like a, as a parent to watch um, Jonathan, your, your last kid, um, play, you know, Real Hondo uh, prep sports, but Real Hondo prep football specifically, to see him and his teammates sing that alma mater for the last time? How, how, how was that emotion for you and uh, the other parents? Well, it was, um, you know, it was kind of finality to Rio Hondo prep football for my kids. It was finality and it was, it was kind of emotional because um, I wouldn't see him out there on the field with um, his guys, with those coaches, with those parents. Um, it's, it's, you, you know, it's, it's, it's sad. It's like, okay, we're turning the chapter and, and you, you wish you had a few more uh, of those experiences with Tim playing um but um you move on like mr i miss remember mr drain saying after one of the cf championship games um uh, the interview the the reporter asked him okay so what's going to happen next year he says well it's always a new group of kids so we just move on to the next season and we keep on going new group of kids it's always it's never never gets old and uh, so that's the feeling i have is you know it's going to move on but i'm going to still support real hunter prep football and it's never it's never going to get old for me i don't think i hope not no, even if, um, you know, I don't have kids, but even if they're not uh, your kids or your children, it's still fun to see those guys that wear the same uniform we used to wear. Uh, yeah. We're you're one of us. We're one of you like th- that never goes away. And that's something that's very unique right. about the Rio experience. Uh, we're going to talk about your other kids as well here. But one final thing about Jonathan is, um, you know, he is trying to uh, pursue college football, continue his playing career. What can you tell me about the recruiting process and kind of where we're at now with Jonathan. So the recruiting process, because of his size, uh, I, you know, this is what Mr. Mr. Carson reached out to some D1 um, coaches and asked them to look at him. But what happens is that because of his size, he, they have to, you know, as they look at the potential recruits, a, a coach or a, team, a, a school, they say, okay, the, you have to fall in this bracket yeah. of size and speed and if you don't fall on that then you know we're not you know we've got all these other guys who are in that who fit in that category so we're going to spend our time looking at those guys we're not going to take a chance on a smaller guy and who doesn't fit into that that category so that's kind of um you know he drops him out of a lot of d1 uh you know you know consideration at all I and mean, who knows i mean i don't i you know he, he's his size I, you know if i was a coach i would say okay i've got to look at this guy who's six foot yeah, 190, 210 over, uh, you know, Jonathan, who's 5'5", 150. So I understand that. So, and then unfortunately on the D2 level, there's not a lot, there's only one D2 school in, in, in Southern California, in California, in California period. And that's because of, there was a proposition passed where schools had to spend the same amount of money on, I think, girls athletics and boys athletics. And so the D2 school said, no, we're not going to do that. And so they dropped football. And so that, unfortunately, that there's not no there isn't any opportunities in California for D2 uh, athletes, and then so that leaves D3 schools in California. And obviously, there's D2 outside of California, but um, he's had some contacts with coaches, and so it's up to him now to you know persuade them to offer, give them an offer. So a lot of it is is selling yourself, mostly on Twitter. That's the big thing is Twitter 
because you put a lot of content on Twitter and show your profile, show your, uh, your accomplishments, your GPA is a big thing. And, um, and then share film with contact coaches. So it's a lot of, um, it's like looking for a job. <laughs> it's like looking for a job. So we'll see. And also another option is also Citrus College. Brandon, uh, head coach at Citrus, Citrus, he started working out with Jonathan when he, after his sophomore year, Jonathan, you know, he contacted me and said, hey, I'd like to work, I'd like Jonathan to work out with me. Uh, so, wow, that's great. And so he, he kind of, um, he was training him until he took, until he got the head Citrus coach job. And he's too, you know, he's very busy, but to take, you know, so he uh, has been working with John, Jonathan works out and he worked out Christmas day, which I said, what are you doing working out? Why are you going? He got up early and went to work out with Ryan McCulloch wow. <laughs> with it, with their, with their train, with their trainer. They have a, uh, uh, a coach that's been training them. And I said, where are you going? You know, I want to work out. So it's fine. He got back before everyone else woke up because, you know, we sleep in on Christmas day. Yeah. So anyway, he's working hard and, and we'll see what, what, what pans out. If Citrus College is, is a good option because um, he can develop, get stronger, get, you know, uh, bigger, faster, and then move on to uh, D2 or wherever else he wants to go. So that's an option also. Well, a lot of guys before him have been told, you know, they were, they weren't big enough to play somewhere or they couldn't play at this level or that level. And that does light a fire under some people. And I could see it in Jonathan for sure. I mean, he's going to work out on Christmas morning of all the things uh, he's definitely dedicated. I wish him nothing but the best. I know division three is maybe not where he wants to land and, and, you know, financially that's tough because they're non-scholarship for the most part, but uh, I could see him excelling, uh, you know, at that level, any level, I think he, he plays, he's going to, he's going to do great. Um, but uh, I, I, I definitely want to see him uh, play more football here in the future. Yeah. He, he wants to play. I, I know that he will. And um, yeah, he, he makes that uh, the Guerrero name uh, quite proud. Uh, <laughs> we've talked all about uh, Jonathan because he recently got done playing ball or for high school anyway. Uh, but tell me about uh, your other kids, uh, Emily, Rebecca, uh, Dave Jr., who was a part of back-to-back uh, -back championship teams in 2011 and 12, but uh, three other real Hondo prep graduates, right? From uh, your family. Yeah. Jonathan, uh, David, um, he, he went on junior high. He started coming to, Rio when he, Rio Hunter Prep when he was in seventh grade, and um, in fact I wasn't I wasn't even thinking of putting the kids in Rio Hunter Prep, and you know I, you know I was okay they're going to school we're not paying tuition okay that's fine, so but Mrs. Orsman came up to me one day when they were at Care you know because they were still in Care Youth League, and she said well when when are you going to put your kids in you know in the school, and I said well I don't know if I can um, can do that um, because you know tuition you know I have four kids so so anyway it worked out and Dave uh started going to real prep in seventh grade and Todd Carson was our coach and so you know Todd's a great great mm. coach motivator teacher and so in seventh and eighth grade uh he said he was really look, looking forward to playing high school football right so his freshman year they were up at football camp in Morro Bay. They would take a trip to Morro Bay oh, yeah. and spend a week up there <laughs> at football camp. And I get this call at, um, I think it was midnight from Todd Carson. Oh. I said, oh, this can't be good. When I get a call, what am I getting a call for? Either he broke some rule or he, you know, he did something he wasn't supposed to do, right? And you now he's in trouble and I have to go pick him up. So anyway, Todd's like, um, um, I got, you know, he was kind of, didn't want to go out right and tell me, but he said Dave broke his leg. Ooh. And I said, Oh, oh no, he said, I think he, he I think he broke his leg. He said, I think he broke his leg. So I said, How'd that happen? And apparently what happened was the freshman said, We're let's let's uh, surprise, let's uh, hide in the bushes. We're gonna surprise the seniors when they come out. This is like at eleven o'clock at night. We're gonna scare them and chicken and ended up being the reverse. The seniors saw the freshman trying to scare them and they started chasing the freshman. So the freshmen started running around the park, right? <laughs> and then, you know, these parks, it's dark, and they have these stone benches and picnic tables, right? Oh. Stone. Oh. So oh. these guys, are, they're running, and these guys are jumping over the table while David didn't see the table, the bench, and he ran into the bench, broke his tibia. Oh. And so, so he was out for his whole freshman season of football. 
So oh. I had to go, <laughs> had to drive up to Morro Bay that next morning and pick them up. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Uh, high school boys, especially are not injured yeah. more often with some of the stuff yeah. that, that we did, you know, things of that nature that we all did too, at that age, just running around being knuckleheads. So. And, then, and then when he was a sophomore, we had a hoop in the backyard and he was shooting hoops, shooting hoops, like in the summer, yeah, in the summer. And he landed on the, on the, um, support with his foot and rolled his foot. Oof. So on his foot he broke a little bone here before Ouch. football season so he ended up missing three games of, or four games of i think three games of his sophomore year of football wow <laughs> so eventually he got on the field and they did really well his soph um his sophomore year and they won the cf championship that team was i think um dave drain was on that team i think oh. um yeah, I think Dave Drain was on that team as alignment. Anyway, they won the CF championship. They're pretty pretty easily. They beat uh, uh, I don't know what school they beat, but anyway, they won that game. Uh, he played linebacker. He did a, did a great job linebacker. And then when they got to the his junior year, um, that's the team that uh, lost to um, Mission Prep, mm. got killed like in the season, the second game of the season. Then they faced him in the championship game. I'm sure you, you were you at that game. Oh yeah, yeah. It's 2012. It was rainy, and their coach was upset at the field because the field was <laughs> not in good condition. And plus, they put all that paint. I remember. You remember that big helmet in the middle of the field? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all that, all that. It was a huge helmet. It took up like you know, it took up like 20 yards of the field, and, and the radius. And it was just, so it was all slippery and wet because it was paint paint and they couldn't they couldn't get their passing game going and uh so we beat them and won the championship then they went to the state bowl playoffs and they they lost that game um a game they probably should have won which is some bad breaks mm. um they their kicker um Duncan was kicked the ball the end zone maybe 80 percent of the time he had kicked the ball short and the, they had returned it and he had to make a, a tackle and he twisted his back. Uh. So, so he twisted his back. He was out of the game. So here we go. We went ahead. Uh, we went ahead by four points, I think. And we had a kickoff and Mr. Drain told the backup kicker, you know, just squib it because the return man was pretty good. So he squibbed it. He went 10 yards. The guy in the front row, you know, front guy caught, got the ball. He made a great. So they're at the 50 yard line. They score with like two minutes left in the game. And they, so they lost that game. Yeah. They were very disappointed. Yeah, Jake Hogan, there was a, uh, Jake Hogan was CF MVP two years in a row. Yeah. Outstanding ball player, you know, yeah. often defensive and he was outstanding. And that was just a great team. Uh, unfortunately, they, you know, they weren't able to win that game. And then when Dave was a senior, uh, they lost to Salesian in the playoffs. And that was a great team. Also, they lost two of their starters, Robbie Hanna and yeah. Isaac Hogan in the playoffs uh, or prior to the in the playoffs. And I think if they had those two guys, they would have won the game. Also, uh, Bollinger got knocked out with a concussion. So they were just a complete mess. And they almost won that game. But if they had their full team, I think they would have won, but that's football, right? That's, that's his, that know. is football. That was a great game. I was at uh, all those games you mentioned and the Salesian game, uh, yeah. they had no, you know, that, that team was very talented and it's not, it's not a knock on our guys, but probably shouldn't have been in that game. And they were, and yeah, with those extra guys, who knows what they could have done. Salesian yeah. pulled away at the end, but what a great career for Dave to be a part yeah. of two championship teams, yeah. to be close in that game in 13. I mean, wow. Yeah, and then one other thing is that, okay, a lot of these guys, they could have played college ball. They wanted – PCC wanted him to come play, but he he's, he told me he was tired of football. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they had um, – they played a lot of football, a lot of football, and I don't think uh, people realize the commitment that goes into football, just the time commitment and the physical commitment that goes into football. It's just – it can be draining. and. It yeah, I think, I think only Nate played at PCC for a little bit, 
And, um, but I think they pretty, I mean, I can't speak for Nate, but I think pretty much they, you know, they played a lot of football. <laughs> it, it was, it was, they were done with football. And well, it's a year round <laughs> thing now. I mean, you know, you, you train in, you're training and football is the one, well, not the one sport, but a sport where you just physically train nonstop for. And yeah, I remember it was, um, uh, who was the older brother was Jake was the older brother, Jake Hogan. Yeah, I actually not- officiated one of his games at PCC. That was cool for me to see a real guy out on the field. Um, uh, James Ramirez was uh, another guy at Redlands universe. Anyway, huh. having ref guys that you saw grow up and play was a lot of fun. And uh, Hogan had a, Great career at Rio and then a little bit in college there. Um, yeah. So all, all things come to an end, whether you're tired or not, you know, it's like, all right, yeah. I'm done with football. <laughs> I joke around with the guys on the, on the sideline, the, uh, the, tra- the, the, not the trainers, the, what do you call them? The supports, the, the young guys who don't play football. Mm. Um, managers. Managers. <laughs> I, I, I'll stand by a manager and I'll stand by a guy in a uniform. And I'll say, see, these guys are the smart guys. They're not playing football. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they know what, you know, when you see an ambul- ambulance at the football game, you know, okay, something's good. Yeah. <laughs> what other sport do they have an ambulance, you know, parked at the football game? It's true. You know, so I, I joke, I say, these, see, these guys are not playing football. They're the smart guys. They, they, <laughs> they understand. They understand. Anyway, anyway. What about your, uh, what about your daughters? Uh, what, when were they in the school? Kind of, were they into sports? What was kind of their story? Well, I guess I didn't play in a ball with my girls because they didn't like weren't really interested in sports <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with so, that. You know, like, all my kids I never never pushed them into sports I never you know if you want to play if you want training that's up to you if you want training I'll pay for your you know to get training but they were um you know like in Carrie's league and they played all the sports uh, but once it got to real hunter prep sports uh, they weren't so interested and Rebecca I really thought she could you know, been done well in volleyball and, and basketball, but she wasn't really interested in, she liked volleyball, but other than that, she wasn't interested in Emily. No, she wasn't interested once uh, she was happy to, you know, to cheer, cheer on the, the teams. Gotcha. So, but, um, you know, I'm proud of them. They, you know, they did well at Rio Hondo prep and, and um, you know, they're going to be successful. So. What are all your kids no up sport, to now? No There's just no, no sport. sport. Yeah, sport. What are the kids up to now? I know Jonathan graduates here in uh, in June yeah. or a couple of months. What are the other kids up to? So uh, Jonathan, yes, yeah, can graduate and still figuring out where he's going to go to college. Hopefully, you know, close, close. And then Emily is uh, going to Zusa Pacific next uh, in the fall. She's uh, majoring. In, she's finished two years. Of, she's finishing two years at PCC and then go to Zusa Pacific in the fall, nice. majoring in journalism. And Rebecca is 22, is uh, working at uh, Spaghetti Factory, and she wants to be a paralegal, so she's got to get back in school uh, soon, and I think she is. And then David is, uh, he's more, he, he's a, a computer programmer. I would have never thought, uh, you know, he was going to do that. He just picked it up on his own when he graduated. He got interested in it. And uh, math, you know, when he was in high school, math was not his thing. And um, now he's you know, checking out math textbooks from the library and, <laughs> and, and interested in math. So his, his whole mind changed um, after high school about his career. And now he's a computer programmer. He's worked on a couple projects uh, as an independent contractor and he's looking to get a full-time job as a computer programmer. But he's been, he's, he's, uh, I think he's gonna be very successful in that field. Oh yeah. Well, you and uh, Mrs. Guerrero should be very proud of uh, all of your kids doing, doing well. It sounds like this gotta be a fun time of year for, for fun time of life. I should say for you guys with all the kids now becoming uh, young adults. Yeah. Yeah. So (laughs) Jonathan, not, not, he's not driving yet, but I have to get him a car. So I got to get a couple of cars here. Emily's going to need a, (laughs) yeah. So I've got to figure out the vehicle situation. (laughs) <laughs> good stuff well we've talked about your kids and jonathan and rio and everything let's talk about you let's go back in time a little bit mm-hmm. and talk about your experience at care and rio i always find it interesting to find out how how did does everyone find and discover care youth league so take me to the beginning when did you first hear of or set foot at uh, care youth league but well, we used to live in el monte and we you know in an apartment complex where we had like a big uh driveway situation between the apartments 
And so that's where we'd play ball, you know, play, you know, we'd play with a tennis ball, not a baseball, <clears throat> play baseball, the tennis ball, you know, because the window situation around yeah. there. <laughs> so, you know, one of the kids there was in, was in Boys Christian League, then it was called Boys Christian League. And he said, hey, why don't you, would you like to come to Boys Christian League? And I didn't hear anything about that. I never saw a bus come by or anyone, I never heard of it. And I said, sure. So I took a ride with um, him and his mom and went to his, went to, he was on Superior. And I think Mr., uh, uh, forgive me for um, getting dates wrong, names wrong. <laughs> it's, it's been a lot, of, it's many years ago, 40 plus years. So if I get any of these dates and names wrong, um, please forgive me. No worries. But, um, so it was, a, it was Superior. And um, it was baseball season. And so we went out there and um, I didn't have a glove. I didn't have anything. So I think it was Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor said, hey, why don't you go out there in left field and you know, we'll hit some balls to you. <clears throat> so this is just a practice. Hit a ball to me. I missed it completely. And one of the kids started laughing at me or making fun of me. Like, hey, you're, you know, what's wrong with you? Something like that. And Mr. Taylor, he said, he, he said, he stopped that kid from, you know, making fun of me. And I thought that was pretty nice of him to, you know, step in like that. So I came, I came back and I, I, I joined the team. We, I, my parents bought me a uniform back then. It was the wool uniforms. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was like, the uniforms were all wool. It was like, wow, this is pretty nice. Yeah. And, uh, but they're pretty hot, you know, in the summer. And then anyway, so he played baseball. Uh, wasn't very good at all. I remember I, I probably got to first base once when the catcher missed the third strike. And that, that was it. That was it. And then uh, I think Mr. Orsman picked up in the summer. And so I just continued with um, with Boys Christian League. Had a good time. Uh, Mr. When I got to uh, fifth grade, I joined the Irish with Mr. Um, Ken Fuller and Jim Hanna. They were in, they were high school kids, right? So they were, they had full charge of the team. Um, as far as I know, I didn't see any other adult, you know, at practices or at the game, you know, uh, but they were my coaches in, on the Irish. That was a fifth grade. And um, I didn't know what I was doing because football, I didn't know anything about football. Um, so anyway, I thought that was pretty interesting. Looking back at it, those guys were, I think probably juniors, I'm not sure. Um, you know, they were, and, you know, they were in full charge of the team. Um, eventually baseball came around. This is interesting. Baseball, it was, uh, you know, they said, well, why don't you try for pitcher? Why don't you try pitching? And I said, okay, let me, let me give it a try. So I ended up, I ended up having a pretty strong arm. So I ended up being a pitcher. Uh, we made the playoffs one year and Mr. Um, and I, I, we lived in Ball Park at this time. And I, I, I couldn't get to the game. I didn't have a ride. So I called Mr. Jim Hanna. I called Jim Hanna and say, you know, I don't have a ride to the game. He comes all the way to ballpark, picks me up, gets to the game like five minutes before the game. And well, he first he picks me up and I didn't have my uniform. <clears throat> and I, he said, well, where, why don't you have you? Well, I didn't sell my tickets. I told him I can't play. I didn't sell my circus ticket quota. I don't know if you had that situation <laughs> yeah. at the quota. So I, I, you know, he picked, he drove all the way to Ballon Park, picked me up, got to the game five minutes before the game, and I wasn't able to play. So that was pretty embarrassing. Um, and um, but anyway, um, and then junior high, still in, you know, didn't go to Rihanna Prep until. All right, so in sixth grade, my parents um, uh, figured out I wasn't going, actually going to school. So they said, well, let's, we better put them in a different school. What happened was uh, ball, this school in Baldwin Park was terrible. It was just, I didn't, you know, it was just, a, it was a terrible situation. Um, I was being recruited to be in a gang. Oh, wow. And so I was smarter. I think I was smarter than that. I said, do I want to be in a gang? No, I don't want to be in a gang. So I stopped going to school. And I just, when parents go to work, I would go out like I'm going to school. I turn around come back home <laughs> so finally the, the they figured it out and so i said well let's put them in a different school so boom rio Hondo prep seventh grade yeah so that's how it happened um 
it's had some great coaches, uh, Mr. Lee and Mr. Smith that I, I, I really appreciate. They were, I, I believe they were my seventh grade coaches right from the beginning, seventh grade. <clears throat> I always said, when they retired, I said, you guys retired too early. You guys retired too early because those two, uh, you know, I had, I had Mr. Fulton was a coach, Mr. Um, Mr. Um, Steve Martin was one of my coaches. Um, a lot of a lot of coaches, but I thought Mr. Smith and Mr. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lee, they just so were outstanding coaches. And um, X's and O's. On top of that, they knew they knew their stuff. And um, and so when we I was in seventh grade and eighth grade, um, they were my leaders, and they kind of um, got us really interested in basketball as a primary sport uh, because they just knew. Their, they knew their basketball. And I think Mr. Lee was a high school, he, he's, he coached uh, varsity basketball for a little bit, I'm not sure. And, but Mr. Smith, and then Mr. Smith continued on it because in that time, when you were in Rio Hondo Prep, you could still be in, um, uh, in seventh and eighth grade, you could still play Care Youth League or Boys Christian League football. So we still played Boys Christian League football while we were in Rio Hondo Prep in seventh and eighth grade. Um, seventh, eighth grade, we didn't have a, a tackle team. We played flight football, but I remember um, I never played quarterback until I was in, I think, seventh grade. And um, there was a kid on our team. Mr. Smith was a, our, our coach in Care Youth League, uh, Boys Christian League. I'm going to say Boys Christian League because I think it was still Boys Christian League. And then, <clears throat> so I was um, not a quarterback. Um, when I got to seventh grade, I think there was, and when I got to eighth grade, uh, that's when I started playing quarterback. Because in seventh grade, there was this kid that was a super quarterback. He was, he was, he was great. His dad would uh, was coaching him, and he he was just. I think he ended up playing college football as a quarterback. So I never got a chance to play quarterback until my eighth until his eighth grade. Um, and eighth grade. Um, Mr. Smith encouraged me to play quarterback. And so I played quarterback uh, when I got to be, um, I didn't really tell you the truth. I didn't really want to be a quarterback. I wanted to be a receiver uh, because I saw Lynn Swan and John Stall Stallworth nice. catching those balls in slow motion, you know, yeah. on NFL films. And I said, man, I'd like to do that. I want to catch the ball, jump up and catch the ball. And so, but Mr. Johnson, uh, I think he came out to one of the games and he, and, and it was one of the games where it was a North South game. I don't know if you remember those. It's like the East versus the West North versus South or something like that. Yeah. Okay. They divide, they divide them up and you have like a, like a, a special game. And, and we were the underdogs. Mr. Chris Horton was my coach at that time. And we were the complete underdogs. They had to actually move guys from the other team to our team. <laughs> <laughs> because or else it would have been like a, it would have been annihilation because the other team was just so good. And so those guys got, hey, okay, we're going to move on the other team. They were like, they were really upset. But anyway, so we played and um, we were, we were underdogs, but um, I, I remember one huddle. It was the final, final drive and we had a chance to win the game. And I said, guys, all right, this is it. We're going to, we're going to score this touchdown. We're going to win the game. And, and so Mr. Johnson was on the sideline watching the game. And I think that's when, and so I threw the pass, got a touchdown. And I think that's when Mr. Johnson decided that I was going to be a quarterback because that was the first year I really played quarterback. And um, so getting into high school, um, JV, Mr. Johnson has me a quarterback. I told him I didn't want to play quarterback, but he said, you know, you can play quarterback. So we were, pre-season we practice with the arch LA guys i don't know why the arch LA guys are practicing with the jvs we don't really need the, <laughs> we don't know do we really need the arch LA guys practice with the JVs? i don't i don't know but anyway so i'm back there i drop back to pass mr greg bollinger's playing defensive end he comes crashing in he sacks me and i land down like this the ball's under my hand and He's on top. I'm on here. He's on top of me. And I said, oh, man. I handle it feel too good. Go back. Take another snap. And say, oh, 
Mr. Johnson, I, my hand doesn't feel too good. Sure enough, broken bone. So <laughs> that was it for uh, you know a few weeks. It wasn't too bad, but uh, I was sidelined. So the next the next guy up was Steve Mendoza, who had a super arm. He should have been quarterback. <laughs> day one. He had he had, he would spin, the ball would spin. You know what I mean? We just yeah. he darts, and um, but and he 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 knows this is true. He was very slow. He, he wasn't a quick, fast runner. If he ran with shotgun, just like Tom Brady, yeah, and he didn't have to run the ball, man, he would. We he could. We would. We, we, and he ended up playing JV quarterback while I was injured. Um, and then uh, what happened was in the, that season. Am I going too long on these stories? No, no. These hey, have at it. It's great. Okay, uh, I'm trying to just hit the highlights. Uh, I was just trying to hit the highlights. But anyway, Byron Kendall was injured. I got injured. He, he sewn against uh, his knee ACL. He was out. Mm. So they needed someone to come up from JV. And so they, so I came up from JV <laughs> to varsity to play tight end, tight end. And um, so I maybe got a few snaps as, as JV quarterback when my hand healed, Yeah. but then I was gone. I was a varsity tight end. And, um, and one of the games, this is my, one of my favorite memories, um, favorite memories. We were at, Monk, we were at um, Chadwick in a day game. They don't have lights then. Mm. I, don't, I don't know if they, still, if they do or not still. But anyway, so it was at Chadwick, a three o'clock game. Mr. Loomis is the, the video guy. He doesn't get there on time. He gets there because of traffic. I don't blame him. Because of traffic. <laughs> he gets there out in the second half. But the, at the end of the first half, uh, we run. The, we were it's uh, you know hail mary time you know for the last play of the half. So Ed Morales, our quarterback, he drops back to pass. I run a route. We're probably at the forty yard line or something like that. I run a route straight down, just straight down the field. He throws the ball. I see the ball. The it's short. The defender. This is. I still can see this play in my head. Unfortunately, it's not on video. The the mom, the, the uh, Chadwick guy. He's going to catch the ball. It bounces off his helmet. Todd Carson remembers this play. He, okay. He, he, he was there. He remembers it. So I'm not, this is not uh, some fairy tale. It bounces off his helmet. <laughs> and I'm behind, I'm behind him. It bounces off his helmet. I, I reach back. I tip the ball. And it's one of those tip things. I'm tipping the ball. Finally get possession of the ball. I'm on the, uh, the left side of the field. <laughs> I start running across this way as they pursuing. I cut across cut across, get tackled in the end zone, touchdown. So it's like, it's, it's, it's halftime, but you know, the team is like piling on me. Like, I, like, you know, like we want yeah. just want to see a championship. Like, okay, th this was, this was nice. And then I just remember the ex looking at Miss, you know, at halftime, we're sitting on the grass and it's, I'm looking at Mr. Dowd, Mr. Dowd's got this smile on his face, just shaking his head. And that, that was one of my favorite memories of all time in Real Hunter Prep football for me. Oh, just that, 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 that moment. And, it, and Mr. Loomis, bless his heart, he missed it. He missed it. <laughs> the world will never know uh, except for the stories you tell. That yeah, is... it's probably better. better than, it's, the memory is probably better than it actually was. <laughs> anyway. Sometimes that's fine. Uh, well, you told me that you played in three – consecutive CIF championship games, 81, yeah. 82, and 83. I know that 82 team was very talented. I believe went undefeated and won the title, but tell me about uh, those three, three separate championship games. Yeah. So um, we played in 81, we played Templeton. Templeton, um, I guess in the pre earlier when like Rod Heaton and Dave Car uh, Todd Carson, they were a, a rival. Templeton was always like the uh, top, one of the top teams. And so they always did battle with Templeton. I don't know my history pre, I don't know. I'm not great with the history of Real prep football pre pre eighties, but anyway, or uh, post post uh, post days, late eighties. Um, yeah. So they were, uh, you know, I was a sophomore. I really hadn't played quarterback, right. Because um, I played one year in junior high yeah. and then I got injured, took a few snaps as a JV. And then, so, all right. So, I still don't want to play quarterback, Mr. Johnson. I don't want to play quarterback. And he insists on me playing quarterback. 
So, okay, I'll, I'll play quarterback because he's the coach. And at that time, I think Steve was only the other, Steve, I think was the only other option. And, and because we run so much, the quarterback, you know, we run the sweeps and Steve was more of a pocket passer. And like I said, he would have been, I mean, we, we switched to a spread offense. I think he would have tore up any defense. So anyway, um, I remember one, one practice, I was like, I can't, I can't do this, Mr. Johnson. I was kept dropping back to pass and I would, I could, first of all, I had bad vision. I couldn't, I couldn't see the defense. I couldn't see the, I couldn't view the yeah. field. I wasn't good at view, at viewing the field. The rushers were coming in, you know? And so I was, I was panicking. I said, Mr. Johnson, I, I don't think I can do this. And so he stuck with me. And that's one of the things when a sophomore quarterback, uh, it's very, unless you're really talented, uh, you, it's very difficult to, to be uh, a sophomore quarterback oh, yeah. and play varsity football uh, because uh, unless you're really polished, you're going to have a hard time reading the defense, finding the receiver with the, with the defensive line coming at you. And if you notice, like, you know, and we've had very few guys that, that I don't know have played sophomore, quarterback sophomore have been really successful. Maybe, you know, some, but I wasn't successful and um, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard unless you're really polished hmm. to play quarterback as a sophomore. You need that experience. So anyway, uh, we went to the, we, somehow we got, to, we got to the finals and we were going against Templeton and this is 81 was a sophomore and it was pretty much, you know, we, Mr. Johnson kind of, uh, you know, gave a hint, you know, this is going to be, you know, we're not, we're not going to win this game. You know, kind of hints, you know. We went up a day early, and it was nice. We stayed up there. And in Templeton, this was the big event in Templeton. I mean, they had the, their stands were full. You can watch the game on YouTube. Uh, it's on YouTube. Um, some of the highlights are some of the game. But their stands were full. They were packed. We had great support. We, I always, when I was in high school, we always had great support from from the coaches teams uh coaches leaders i mean they went to they went to almost i mean all, great support um first possess, first uh, possession for us i threw a pick six oh. threw a pick six the other thing I, I stress about sophomore quarterbacks don't throw the ball across the middle <laughs> don't, throw, don't throw the ball across the middle sophomore quarterbacks unless you are you know i don't know don't even throw a screen pass across in the middle. Anyway, so I threw a pick six. I didn't see the linebacker. He came in and got that ball and scored. Then our next possession, uh, our fullback got a helmet on the ball. Ball popped out. So we're down. We ended up losing that game by, uh, I think, 48 to 24. 48 to 24. Hmm. So Mr. Johnson, um, uh, I mean, he did all he could to try and win that game, but um, we just didn't have the talent. Our their defense, their offensive line was just was just stronger than than we could handle. Yeah, he pushed us down the field. And, and um, anyway, so when I was a junior, we um, we had a great team. Uh, we had uh, I had a tight end that was six six. Derek Durden. And, uh, Derek Durden. Yeah, and. He has since uh, passed away. Um, oh, really? I yeah. Had, I had not heard that. Two years ago, he had uh, a, um, uh, a, a blood disease or something like that. Now, fortunately, oh, he, was a, he was the happiest guy. He was just a, a great individual. And, huh. you know, he was just uh, super. He would end up working at Monrovia High School as a, security, for secu as a security guard. And the kids loved him. Everyone loved him mm. that knew him. But anyway... Um, so that year, and we had uh, two running backs who both rushed for a thousand yards, Don Bedoya and Scott Moore, and they were they were great. Uh, Don Bedoya is probably um, best fullback I've ever seen. Uh, just powerful, strong, agility, everything. Scott Moore was the fastest. You know, he was just as fast as any other running back that I know of. The Real Honda Prep. He was just uh, he was just fast. Anyway, we uh, we went undefeated that year and um i can't remember it's funny you know when it's when it's easy 
it seemed like that season was very easy. You don't have a lot of um, a moment. lot of a lot of memories of hey, this was a tough game. We really yeah. You know, I could be wrong. I mean, my memory's not that great, so I could, it could be wrong. We could might have had uh, one or two tough games that season. Um, I think it was that year I had I had walking pneumonia, Oof. and it's uh, Mr. Johnson still wanted me to play. <laughs> still wanted me to play, and I did play. Um, I don't know. I, I see this also in Todd and Mark Carson. Also, the coaches they you don't sit out a game for anything. <laughs> you don't sit out the game for anything, right? <laughs> no. Nope. It's like you know, you're carelessly going. You know, I can't play today. My stomach, you know, I got a stomach ache or something like that. No, you play. You're going to play. If we need you to play, you're going to play. Uh, thing is, I don't, I don't think I needed to play. But <laughs> anyway, I had walking pneumonia. <laughs> I couldn't call the signals. I couldn't call the signals. So someone else called the signals when we we're in the huddle. And I, I don't know why I played, but uh, Mr. Johnson wanted me to play. So that was a mercy game. We mercyed them. So, you know, so. Maybe that's why. I, you never know. Hey, you play it through pain. That's, that's like another thing that makes football different than other sports, I think, yeah. uh, hands down. Um, I'm trying to remember some important things. Well, back to when I was a sophomore. Yeah. We played Montclair Prep. And um, they – they beat us, uh, like they skunked us or something. And they're not skunked us, but they beat us pretty bad. They had a, 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 a guy on their team, Toy Cook, who was just an outstanding ball player. He ended up playing for the New Orleans Saints as a defensive back. Wow. He would just, you know, we'd punt to him, he'd run it back. You know, he'd punt to him. I remember running down the field. I was the long snapper that year. And so the long, I would run down the field and I, I got him. And he, he put a move and I was head down on the, on the turf. <laughs> So, but we got him back in the uh, semifinals when the the rain came hard. It was like the hardest rain, you know, the, we, we call it the rain bowl because it was just pouring rain, like sheets of water coming down. And, <laughs> and they couldn't get their game going. They couldn't get the running game going. Their punter, it, it was sad. The, they, when they had to punt, the guy could not <laughs> pull the ball and punt it. I mean, he had punts like five yards, 10 yards or something. I don't know. He had some short punts. And uh, we ended up winning that game 25 to zero wow. to go to the final. Was, was, that a, was that a game where Mr. Johnson brought in like a, the rubber football as compared to like the leather? I had heard like in a big rain game like that, he had some rubber football yeah. set aside for bad weather or something. Yeah. Mr. Johnson um, was – Every little angle Mr. Johnson would be thinking about every angle that would give us an advantage. Mm. And so, yeah, he, he was, he was a special coach in that regard. Uh, just uh, ahead of um, the other coach. I mean, I think he yeah. was always um, thinking ahead of the other coach, how to beat the other team with every angle. But one of the things that happened that game, which I, I remember is very, very bad sportsmanship. Ooh by one of our guys on our team. Um, but it's still funny, I think. <laughs> so I'll tell the story. <laughs> but So Mike Dore, he was kind of um, mischievous, I would say. He was, he, was, he was a tough, he was 6'4", you know, 200 and whatever. He was a big guy. So this was sophomore year. Montclair, this was in the ring game, uh, had a kid on the team, it was Robert Conrad's son. I don't know if you know who Robert Conrad is. Mm -mm. Actor, probably before you know, this is before your time. <laughs> so he was an actor, um, and he a tough guy actor. You know, he was a tough guy. He was, he was small though. He was small, and you do these commercials where you have an Energizer battery on his shoulder, and he was like, "I dare you know this Energizer battery was the best. I dare you to knock it off. You know, like I dare you to knock it off my shoulder. You know, <laughs> like he's a tough guy. so anyway. Mike Dore is uh, his son's on the on Montclair, Mike Dorr is like giving them the business the whole game. Like, so what's going on? What's going on over there? It's like, they're still, they're still playing and the play's over. And Mike Dorr was like, I don't know why he, something about this, you know, he just wanted to block this guy into the ground every time. And so Robert Conrad's on the sideline and yelling at Mike Dorr saying, hey, stop that. And I don't know what he was saying, but he was mad. He was like mad. 
at Mike. And Mike goes, looks over the shoulder, he looks over and says, goes like this. <laughs> Robert Conrad I'd say, like, not, I dare you to knock it off. That was bad sportsmanship. <laughs> it was funny, but it was bad sportsmanship. The referee eventually said, hey, knock it off, you two. You know, he had a step between yeah. Mr. Conrad and Mike Dorn. Hey, guys, knock it off. But anyway, um, that season, we, we just rolled I, pretty much, I think, over everyone to win to win uh, that championship so the templeton um, templeton in the finals again this time at at rio hondo prep yes yeah, yeah. Templeton in the finals and we beat them 35 to 12 and um yeah this it, it was it was it was a good i mean it was a great season um and then when i was a senior we lost to uh, el paso robles in the finals and we lost by i think three touchdowns so mm. they were the better team they just had a they were just you know faster stronger bigger than us and so we lost to them um anyway that's football yeah was Paso Robles was that like a continuation school or something I'm trying to remember yeah they had a arm security with them when they went to the game <laughs> in fact when we were sophomores we beat them when we were sophomore uh junior so I'm sorry junior year we beat them they had a guy it's who at halftime jumped the fence and took off. He, uh, he escaped. <laughs> so that was something we learned about after the game. Okay, well, why are we playing? Why are they even out playing away games? You know, it's like, maybe they should just play home games or something like that. You know? <laughs> uh, Oh, small schools football. You see it all. You yeah, see it yeah. all. Let me tell you, uh, Templeton was like 180 miles north of here and everything. And then yeah. playing present schools. But hey, that's Rondo Prep football. Uh, what about uh, other sports? You said you, you guys into really into basketball? We were into basketball, Mike, Steve, and uh, and me. We in junior high, because Mr. I, I, in my opinion, this was Mr. Lee and Mr. Smith were just, uh, just were great basketball coaches, in my opinion. And then so in the summers, when we got into high school, we would go down to the beach and play pickup ball. We'd go to the beach and play pickup ball, you know, where you're, you're in a rotation, winner stays on, loser gets off. Yeah. So we'd play pickup ball uh, just down at the beach. And, you know, after a game, you just go to, go to the beach. So, and I think we got better because of that. But we just loved basketball. We wanted to win a basketball championship. And when we were... Um, I found this out just recently that, you know, Joe Parker's team, they got to the championship, uh, CF championship game against Crossroads when they were in Long Beach, uh, when they were 79-80 um, uh, season. Yeah. And they lost to Crossroads. And Mark Hartwig was on that team, and he was a sophomore. No, a junior, a junior. And no, he was a sophomore. But anyway. Mr. Dowd said, Ms. Mark didn't get in the game. And Mr. Dowd said, you know what? Don't, don't worry about it. In two years, you'll be back. In other words, we were in eighth grade. My, my, my class were in eighth grade. In two years, when we're, we're sophomores, we're going to be back at Long Beach for the championship game. That's what Mr. Dowd thought of us as a, as a team. Wow. So, so Mark, <laughs> Mark just relayed this story to me you know, recently. And, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty, that's a lot of confidence. So when we were JVs, uh, we were undefeated, like 24-0. Yeah. We beat everyone play. We ever played everyone. We even beat the alumni. So we were feeling pretty good going to the so going to our sophomore year. Uh, and then we got to the semifinals against Mont Montclair Prep, the team we beat in football yeah. um, that year. Uh, and, and so we felt pretty good. I felt pretty good. I mean, they weren't anything special. The special teams were on the other other side of the bracket. You know, if we were to win this game, the next game, I don't know if we were going to win that game or not. It would be, it would have been really tough. It was either Polly or uh, Chadwick. And so anyway, or Crossroads. <clears throat> They're on the other side of the bracket for some reason. I don't, I think. So anyway, we get to the, we get there. We're bigger than them. We're, we're better than them. Their point guard can't shoot. That's the scouting report. We, we, we let them dribble all the way to the free throw line. If he wants to shoot the ball, shoot it. So the referees, I don't know what happened. The referees decided hey, we're going to call it tight. We had uh, our starting center, Mike Dora, who, was, who was, had a phenomenal season. He was on the bench 
hmm. most of the game. First quarter, two fouls quick. So we get to reg end of regulation, and we're playing. We get we're playing almost everyone because people are in foul trouble. And uh, <clears throat> we get to end of regulation. We're down two. We call timeout. We throw the ball in, and Steve Mendoza hits a, the sh a shot. There's no three point lines back then. Hits a shot, and we go to overtime. Okay, so in overtime. Uh, we, we tie it up again. We get up to the third overtime. But by then, we're down to four players, four guys. Oh, my. So it's four on five. I'm one of the four guys out there. Um, it doesn't work. It does Four against five doesn't work. No. <laughs> it's like the home blow trotters against, you know, you know the, whoever they play, the Washington Nationals or whoever. It's, uh, you know, they can pass the ball, do whatever they want, four guys. And we end up losing by 16 points in the third overtime. Oh, so man. that was pretty, that was pretty, uh, I always joke with Joe Parker. I said, Joe, because he was an assistant coach. I said, Joe, you couldn't get us two more points. You couldn't get us two more points in regulation. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, so we didn't win. And in the next two years, we, we lost in the semifinals each year. Semifinals, semifinals. We never got to that championship game. never got to Long Beach. In fact, when we were sophomores, Mr. Jim Key was so confident we were going to get to the championship game, he, he printed up bumper stickers, said, Rio Hunter Prep basketball, see you in Long Beach. Oh, man. So before, before that Montclair game, he was so convinced we were going to get to the Long Beach Convention Center, play a championship game. He printed bumper stickers. And so I hope people didn't, uh, you know, we're able to get those bumper stickers off. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I like when a venue um, is kind of predetermined with a, a championship or whatever. So you yeah. can kind of have that, have yeah. that goal. That's uh, well, that's disappointing, but Hey, that happens, especially on the hardwood. Yeah. Sounds like you guys had some really good teams there. Um, and then uh, of course, baseball season's kind of this, uh, this extra sport we play or whatever, but uh, and you were telling one me, more. go ahead. One more story is the Chadwick. Yeah. When we were sophomores they they were so they were very cocky very cocky and the first time we played chadwick away they come out with a, a record player you know how you play the pre-game music yeah but back then you, you know you didn't have ipods or whatever so you had they brought the record player and the song they played was another one bites the dust <laughs> <laughs> So I was like, man, that really? Come on. There's another one bites the dust. And we did lose. So I guess they're they're right on on that. <laughs> so firing you up though, I'm sure. Yeah, uh yeah. what what about after? Did you guys have any good baseball runs uh, in you as well? No, or? we did we did. We um we did. When I was a senior, we got to the semifinals. Semifinals. When I was I I would say I peaked as a sophomore athletically unfortunately when i was a sophomore after that it was all downhill as far as athletically um i ended up i started as a shortstop but got moved to second base because i had like a steve Sachs kind of moment in my my baseball career <laughs> you know what i mean it's like yeah. i was at shortstop as a freshman and i was pitching but when i got the shortstop I had this uh, problem throwing the ball to first base. For some reason, I don't know if you, I don't know wh what happens. It's some psychological thing. It has to be because you're just playing catch, right? You catch yeah. the ball and you throw, throw the ball. And I just was off. I was off. And I, you know the the booth up there above uh, first base, oh, yeah. know, the office there? They had plexiglass back then. And Mr. Hampton <laughs> used to sit up there watching the games. <laughs> And I threw a couple balls off that plexiglass, and that was, and that was, I think that was it. And so I got moved to second base. But when we were um, uh, seniors, we got to the semifinals. <clears throat> I don't even remember who we were playing. Mr. Johnson, you know, he would have, I don't know if, did you play for Mr. Johnson? No, no, didn't have the uh, privilege. Yeah, so in baseball, he would chart out all the, all the, Wherever the ball was hit, foul ball, fair ball, he had a big chart. And someone in the one of the managers was in there with a with a big board, and he would plot all the wherever the ball was hit, boom, 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 boom. And 
So we played a short center fielder. I don't know yeah. if you know, you heard of that. Mm -hmm. Especially on that home field, it's, it's it's not bad because you know center field is right there. So we played a short center fielder with two outfielders. So it was up to the pitcher to pitch according to Mr. Johnson, which shift the outfielders, you know, based on the batter, based on who's pitching, and the pitcher had to pitch in the right location, so it'd all work out. So he had the shift. I don't know if they were even Major League Baseball was doing shifts like that. But <laughs> yeah, way before it's time. Yeah, so he plotted out, and he saw a, a lot of base hits were going right up the middle. So that's why he had the short center fielder. He'd play behind second base, maybe about 10 yards. And so when we were um, uh, seniors, we got to the semifinals, and I could still have this – I still picture this in my mind. I can still see it. Um, we were uh, – it was a pitching duel. I and mean, we were just, it was zero, 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 maybe three hits. Maybe they had three hits. I don't know. Got down to one of the innings and we had the shift to left field. And I was second base. So basically I'm a right fielder too. So I'm out there oh, wow. back, way, way back. The guy hits the ball. I, I'm sure it was just, the pitch was a little outside and, so he went with the pitch, hits the ball. I jump as high as I can. It's like a six inches over my glove. I can still see the ball going over my glove and triple. So that's a triple. That guy scores. We lose one zero. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but you know, one zero, we didn't score any runs, so we couldn't win anyway. So, right. So yeah, there it is. I mean, who knows how long the game would have uh, kept yeah. going. That's crazy. Yeah. The shift way ahead of its time. And uh, man, Randall Johnson, what a mind, what a mind just yeah. with all, all his coaching. He had the scouting, he had scouting reports on base, on the baseball for baseball, which <laughs> is pretty, was unusual. I don't think anyone does that now. I don't mean he, um, he had scouting reports on the, the hitters That's and crazy. he'd feed it to, to the pitchers and we'd have flashcards and, <laughs> and we'd like, no, okay, this guy does this, this guy's tendencies. And yeah, yeah that was unusual. That was, I was like, That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. What about uh, after high school for you? What uh, did you stay in RHLA a little bit? I've heard some RHLA uh, base, baseball stories from uh, back in the day. Tell me about yeah. after high school. So I stayed at RHLA for a couple of years, two years. And um, I worked in the concession stand. Mr. Joe Parker was one of my favorite guys at Rio Hunter Prep. I just, uh, he's, nice. he's the best, you know. So he was, I worked with him because he worked in concession. <clears throat> that was his thing. He was concession stand. And in fact, Mr. Parker, because he was uh, he was an assistant coach when I was in a freshman. Um, he gave me my first cleats, a pair of cleats. I don't know what happened. I didn't have cleats. Uh, my parents, um, you know, I think I had a pair of cleats, but they're the wrong color because I was a JV and JV were a different color than the varsity. So my parents, you know, they they struggled. You know, they put me in real. They paid a lot of money for my tuition. And um, so, you know, they didn't have a lot of money for extra extras. So Mr. Parker gave me his cleats to wear. Um, so I wore his cleats when I was on varsity because, um, you know, I didn't have, we didn't have, I didn't have two pairs of cleats. But anyway, when I was in Archelay, Mr. Parker, I worked in a concession stand with him. And um, we used to actually cook hamburgers and fries up on the bank. I don't know if you remember that. Wow, no. I think we stopped after a while because it's probably a hazard because we used to have the fry machine up there in the bank. We used to have it. Uh, uh, we used to have it out, you know, so it wasn't on the bank. It was out. It was like a little, um, a little setup where we had a little shelf nice. and we cook hamburgers and fries on the bank. So each Friday we'd go stock the bank and move the fryer up there and move the, the grill up there. <laughs> And so it was fun, but looking back, I think, wow, if that fry machine would have fallen down or something like that, all that caught grease, you know, <laughs> but the fries were the, were the best. And I think people, I mean, after, you know, for many years when we had concession, the fries, there was always a line for French fries in, oh, yeah. out there, in the, yeah, out there. But Mr. Parker um, wanted to have a baseball team, an archery baseball team. And so he got it to, he, he got it together. He got uniforms. Uh, 
we paid for the uniforms, but uh, you know, he, he arranged for the uniforms and a schedule. And so we played Archlight baseball for, I mean, I played for a couple of years. I think they continue to play after that, <coughs> but it'll, it was, it was, it was fun. Joe was a catcher. <coughs> I'll say this about Mr. Parker. When he wants to get something done, he absolutely gets it done. I mean, I remember he was influential on making the football field 11 man size for us to go oh. to 11 man. I mean, he was a big part of all that kind of spearheaded the effort. So when he, when he gets determined to do something, he, he definitely makes it happen. Yeah. I didn't know that about 11 man, about the field, but um, no, he was, he got it together. He got a schedule together and we played a lot. We played whoever, I guess, whoever we could, we played some, um, mm -hmm college teams I, was, I think it's the jv's te jv teams we played uh, mexican um, baseball league teams um we played um, travel ball teams or something like that like minor league you know lower level teams um <clears throat> so one game we played I'll, this is another memory that i'll always remember something i'll always remember is that mr weidman was you know he was a great athlete he was a shortstop I was a second baseman and um, in Archelae, I was a second baseman. And then um, one of the games we played, I think at Whittier Park, um, the field, there was no outfield fence because in the outfield, it went to the trees, the tree, the trees were out there in the outfield. Okay. But the outfield was, you know, like maybe 400, 500 feet before you get to the trees. I think it, was, it, was, it had to be over 400 feet, you know, so the, the tree line was basically, you know, no one's going to hit the ball out there. So, you know, no, no reason to build a fence out there. So <laughs> Mr. Weidman, I'll never forget this, it's a night game, right? So the lights are cover the outfield. It's a, it's a nice, it's a, it's an okay baseball field. Mr. Weidman gets up there and he hits this ball and it's a, it's a rocket. It's like, it's going, going, and it disappears into the tree line. I'm serious. It disappeared into the tree line. You can't, you, it went past the lights, so you couldn't see the ball any longer. It was, it was, a, it was amazing. It was, uh, it was amazing. It was a, a rocket shot, and um, but he's pretty modest. I don't think he would ever, I don't think he would ever remember it. Mention that, but he was, he was very excellent. He was an excellent batter. Um, I can't even remember all the other guys on the team. To tell you the truth, um, I was basically a slap hitter. Yeah, so I would just basically make contact. That was my, what I tried to do. Oh, man. Um, I do remember one game with Mr. Lenny. Oh, Mr. Lenny was um, the manager. And um, we were playing this um, farm league, Atlanta Brave farm league team. And um, I was pitching and I was getting hit. Boom, boom. <laughs> ball was going off the fence. Ball was going between, on the outfield. Boom, boom. Everything. Foul balls were going like, wow, look at that ball. Look at how, you know, this foul ball. And so Mr. Lenny's coming out to the mound. I said, oh, great. This is my chance to get off the mound, right? So he's coming out to the mound. I got the ball. You know, like some pitchers, they don't want to give away the ball, right? They don't want to give it to the manager. Yeah. Well, I was ready. I was like, come get the ball, Mr. Lenny. Take the ball from me. And he got out there. And I think he probably was going to take the ball. But he's, when he saw I wanted to give up the ball, he's like, no, you're not. You're going to stay out here. You're going to stay out here and finish this inning. And you know, he's, I think he said, you're not going to quit or something like that. He's, he said, you're not going to quit. You're going to finish this inning. And I said, okay. And um, it was, um, I don't know how many runs they scored, but it, we finally finished. I finally finished that inning. And, but I appreciate that about Mr. Lenny. He wanted, um, he didn't want me to quit. He didn't, um, uh, so, yeah, so that's, that was something that I will never forget. Good, good stories at the time. Yeah. Oh, humiliating. Oh yeah. No, it's, you know, there's a lot of lessons learned from stuff like that. You remember obviously to this day and uh, maybe a little embarrassing at the time, but in the long run, big scheme of life, it's something that uh, was memorable and taught a lesson probably. Yeah, definitely. Mr. Humility. Humil yeah. Which <laughs> we need more of uh in this crazy world we live in, you know, uh, Mr. Lunny was special, just so special. Uh, yeah. what about, what did you end up, um, career wise? What did you end up going into? What have you been, uh, 
uh, what do you what do you do now the, to this day, or have, has it all kind of blended together? What about after RHLA and all that? Yes, yeah, so I'm uh, I'm an IRS appeals officer. I work for the Internal Revenue Service as an appeals officer. Hmm. And what that is is uh, when someone has an audit, they have the right to appeal the audit results. And so I listen to their appeal. My job is to resolve uh, tax controversies without litigation in a manner that's fair to the taxpayer and the government. So my job is to be impartial. Even though I work for the IRS, my job is to be impartial, not to advocate for either the government's position or the taxpayer's position. It's an opportunity for a taxpayer to um, get their um, audit resolved without going to tax court. Because the next step, if they uh, don't resolve it with me as an appeals officer, they go to tax court and go before a judge um, to have their case heard. So. Um, I, I used to be, a before I was an IRS appeals officer, I was an IRS revenue agent, which means that, you know, I would go out and audit, conduct audits. And so I, I, I really enjoy my job right now, even though it's pretty, uh, we have, we need more employees. We're pretty overwhelmed with, we're pretty well overwhelmed with work. But as far as the, the mission, I enjoy the mission because it allows me to resolve cases for people who um, are, are actually, you know, uh, you know, had an audit and they disagree and feel like they didn't get a fair hearing uh, during the audit. So it allows me to resolve cases. And I think I'm very fair. And yeah. Impartial. Oh, that's uh, wow. That's interesting stuff. I didn't, I didn't realize that uh, he's kind of like the uh, the kind of like a referee and in between kind of guy uh, being yeah. impartial. You seem to have a good demeanor for that and dealing with the, uh, with the people in the yeah. two different uh parties there at hand well we hope uh, i think most people listening out there hope they never have to contact you for any for, for the, in that regard but uh, it's good to know that there are people like you who are help uh, helping out <laughs> no, i'm thankful for my job i mean i'm you know i never want to complain about anything i have i mean i'm really grateful for everything i have my wife my children my health a job i know there's a lot of people who are struggling so um you know, whatever. Another blessing actually is each day I go to work, I, I, I walk past maybe 30 homeless mm. people, people begging for money. Um, just people that are, you know, that are struggling. And so each day I, I go to work, I am reminded that, hey, I could be that guy. I could be that person. Um, you know, I was born in the United States of America. My parents sent me to a school. You know, um, I have opportunities that were not necessarily my doing, you know, and I don't know these people's situations. So when I walk past them, I'm not like, hey, get out of my way. You know, you're, a, you know, you're homeless. Don't bother me. It's like, oh. Wow, um, these people, I don't know how they got to that situation. You know, maybe bad decisions, maybe not. Maybe, you know, tough, tough things happen to them. So I'm grateful every time I go to work. It's, it's, it's just a constant reminder that I have nothing to be on. Thank, you know, I have to everything to be thankful for. Yeah, so that's a, that's a real, yeah. real good note to go out on. Um, yeah, we need to all count our blessings daily. And uh, I know you, you are the forefront of that. And, you know, remind, I see some of your uh, very inspirational Facebook posts that I always uh, like uh, the words just because it's, it's a reminder, as you, as you said there, so eloquently uh, going to work every day. Mr. Guerrero, this has been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. Uh, it's, it's after Christmas, but a happy uh, belated Christmas to you and a happy new year. Uh, I can't believe 2022 is, uh, is here upon us. Yes. 2022, <laughs> hopefully uh, everything will get back to normal and um, people can go about their lives before, like they did before COVID, but uh, we'll see. It's just whatever comes to pass, we have to be, um, just be thankful for what we have. And I appreciate you, Matt, and um, Care Youth League, Voice of Christian League, Real Hunter Prep, all, all great uh, influence you know, on me. And I appreciate all the leaders. There's so many people that had an uh, impact on my life that um, 
you know, I'm grateful for. So, yeah. Very well Thank said. You for doing what you're doing. Hey, hey, and we're counting down the days already until next uh, Real Hondo Prep football season. Can't wait for August to get right, here. Right. <laughs> Thanks again, sir. Good talking to you. Bye. Well, a huge thank you to Mr. David Guerrero Sr. for taking the time to sit down with me and have a conversation about his experiences with Rado Prep, Carrie Youth League, and of course, uh, his children who've gone through the program as well. We wish uh, everybody nothing but the best, a happy 2022 to everyone, and uh, really looking forward to where Jonathan Guerrero lands in his football uh, pursuit of playing college football. And um, I think no matter where he lands, that school is going to get a very, very uh, gifted player and someone who's going to work very, very hard. So uh, happy new year to the entire Guerrero family and looking forward to, you know, I don't know, at least keeping the, the, the Guerrero boys are done playing football, but they get to join us now in, in our club of being alumni and looking at kids way younger than us who uh, are, we're, we're rooting for and the the tradition continues if you will so we will uh, keep our eyes open and uh, see what happens with Mr. Jonathan Guerrero and maybe uh, maybe just maybe we'll make that announcement on the podcast if um, if he does in fact land at a school so guys thanks for joining me today it's been a pleasure as always talking with someone on the Friday episodes just having a conversation about the past and kind of just uh, stories, memories, all those things. I think it's something we all need as we head into a weekend to kind of refresh and get ready for another week and then another week and we just keep this thing going. So if anybody has any suggestions for some guests for me to talk to, by all means, reach out to me. I love uh, p- putting together these episodes. And even if I've never met the person before, I've done a few of those and, and they've worked out just fine. So uh, any suggestions, any requests, um, I can continue to try to do that. Um, a lot of guests that I reach out to are from suggestions and I've said, Hey, so-and-so would like to have you on the podcast or whatever. And that does help. So you know where to reach me, get home, safe podcast at yahoo.com for our questions, content, topics, everything there. And of course you can listen to our podcast pretty much anywhere. Uh, Apple, Amazon, Google, Spotify, as well as our YouTube channel where you can watch the podcast and uh, leave commentary and those things as well. So as always, great. Thank you to all of the great support out there from the get home safe podcast family that the community that we have the the fan base it's been just such a blessing and i continue to uh, be blessed every time i step in front of this microphone talking to great people like mr dave guerrero that i did uh, today so guys have a great weekend enjoy 2022 i can't believe it's here it's I can't even write two just got to remember two numbers now two two which is uh which will make a little hopefully things easier we don't have to correct that. Uh, th- usually it takes me to like March to, to know what year it is. But anyway, uh, 2022 is here. Uh, hopefully it is uh, better than 21 and 20, of course. But uh, guys, have a great weekend. Enjoy the new year. And guys, as always, no matter what you're doing, whether you're out on the town or around in third base, get home safe. <laughs>